Okay, so let me say uh, hi here since I'm now a new master of my technology because I've done it twice. Um, so you can see me now. We're going to draw on the regular old uh, paper here, which I'm excited about. So I'm going to talk about the eye and I'm going to show you, you know, we've been talking about the eye, so no surprise there. Um, I'm going to show you a basic rendering technique that's kind of tried and true. Uh, and it's one of those more intuitive approaches, and it's one of those when in, and when in doubt, simplify. So at each stage of the process, it's going to look pretty good, and then we can keep upping the ante and try and make it a little better, a little better, a little better. Uh, so it's a pretty clear process. So let's jump over. Uh, yay, paper. That's right. Um, and... Uh, uh, let's uh, let's jump over and get drawn. So over, oh, just let me say real quick, over uh, in the kind of upper left, those are eyes. I'm not sure we'll get to get to them. Uh, well, actually, we could do either one. Here's a sergeant, Lady Agnes, very famous painting. It's on the cover of a couple books. Uh, this is uh, Abbot Thayer, um, who's a, a big fan of his. He was a American tonalist around the time of Whistler and Sargent. Uh, little known, most of his work was bought by Freer, who has a Freer Museum in Smithsonian. Uh, amazing work. And this is a, a close-up of, he painted, his wife died and he had some daughters, and he painted his daughters uh, and a son, I believe, two daughters and a son, and would paint them all the time, usually as angels. So these are the eyes of a little angel here, his little angel. So let's get going, and... I'll show you what I'm going to do here. Good. So let's do that. Well, I don't need to do that. I actually have it on my computer up here. If I can get it to wake up. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. They're a little clearer than Lady Agnes, maybe. So if I'm going to render, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw two sides of the form, and then I'm going to draw the shape of the shadow on the form, and then I'm going to give the shadow a value. And if I zigzag with whatever tool, my finger or pencil, stump, eraser, to uh, reduce Okay, so uh, subtract pigment. I can get the gradation there, but I want to try and get with whatever means I'm comfortable with. Let's see here. I want to get two sides of the form, shape of the shadow on the form, give the shadow a shape, and then it starts to have the volume or the volume, depending on whether there's gradation or not. It'll be more boxy or more rounded. So let's do it again. Two sides of the form. Shape of the shadow on the form. Give the shadow a value. And we want that shadow to be a darker value than the light, so that when we squint, the light stay light, the shadows stay dark, and the two don't separate. And it can be crude. It could be a series of hatches. It could be done with pen and ink to build down to that darker value. It can be blended. It can be painterly, whatever. We'll do a little more cleaner version of that, but that's the process. And then that way I can then look at how it connects to the next thing. And I might well then separate the other two sides and create the whole separate ball or a whole ball covered by, by two eyelids kind of thing. But that's going to be kind of the process. So what I end up doing then, if it's, and you'll see it better in this process here, if I'm going to take it farther to not open this up for a snowman, let's say, or a lumpy muscles, then I'm going to want to do the two sides and eventually do one or both ends. So let's say that the uh, top of the snowman doesn't have another ball on top of it because it's a top. And I'll just uh, 
do this. And I fade it right over with shape of the shadow, shape of the form, top instead of the two sides. Got the top, got the right side, I went and got the left side, got the top, I'm going to go back and get the bottom. And however that bottom manifests through contour or tone, then I'll approach that problem as a second step. And again, it can be painterly or not. And I'm going to do that not fully using the full value. I'm not going to go as dark in the lashes of the pupil or the iris, maybe, than I could. I'm going to work in kind of a mid-range, middle dark for the shadows. So we could make it pure white in the lightest part of the eye, pure black in the darkest part of the eye if we wanted to. I'm going to back off that. I'm going to do middle light and middle dark or wherever, anywhere in there. It doesn't matter too much. As long as the shadows are relatively dark, the lights are relatively light, and it's not full value. <clears throat> then what? look what happens. If I want to come back and add corrections to that shadow shape or make it more beautiful because it's pretty crude, not really beautifully crafted, I can correct it. And if I want that form to pop, I can punch it. I can now render as a second, third, fourth step down even darker. So now I'm going to come back to that core shadow. I'm going to redesign that core shadow, however I see fit, and then I'll blend it again. Now look at how much darker and more powerful that shadow is against the lights. And let's push this down for greater effect. Middle dark, middle light. So let's say I kept that was my middle light to begin with. So now it's even more powerful than it was. My process is getting better and better and better. The shape design of that core shadow edge is a better design, let's say. Let's assume we all like it better than I, what I did before. The shadow is more darkly shadow than it was before. The pop of the form is more striking than it was before. All of that stuff is working great. Maybe even because I'm spending more time and I got more pigment to work with, the gradation, the rendered gradation of those forms were even better than they were before. And that would be true if it's just a light on a vignetted page or if it's sitting in an environment that we create, like a Rembrandt where we have a dark, dark environment. Notice whatever tool I'm using, I'm just doing zigzag gradations. And the more I zig and the more I zag, the more I work that material, that medium, that surface. And I want a good paper to allow for this surface to be kind of abused because I am abusing it. I abuse my poor books too sometimes, which I'm sure horrifies some of you. But they're, they're working class books. They, they work for a living. So I work that out and I keep refining, refining, refining. And now I've pushed those shadows darker. I can go back and push them even darker yet. And I can push the lights lighter. In a beautifully rendered way, in a painterly way, whatever. It doesn't matter the technique. But now I can pull out those lighter half tones and that pop of that highlight. And now I've, by process, I pushed the shadows down even darker 
and I've pushed the lights up even lighter. And now I get that full pop. So that's a strategy most renderers use actually in most mediums, not all. Watercolor, you have to layer up or really layer down. Each wash takes it down darker, darker, darker. Then they might add a little bit of white gouache or something, uh, Sergeant Wood sometimes, oftentimes. <clears throat> but usually you work in that mid range and then you push the extremes. Uh, and so we're going to use that mid range, we'll call it mid range rendering strategy to get more accurate values of shadow against light and or foreground against background. And to ease in the full con of strategy, full contrast of whatever we're trying to create. So with that in mind, and with a little bit of time we have left, I'm going to look real quick. Hey, thanks, Ashwini, for helping out. Appreciate it. Okay, so everything's good. No extra comments. So let's look at uh, this. Let me get my reference here that's not getting glared out by the studio lights. And we'll give it a shot. So you'll construct it, you'll draw it, you'll lay it in any way that's comfortable. But I'm going to start out with, let's do this, I'll push it even a little farther. I'm going to start out with a toned paper or a toned canvas. It'll be a little better for you. This paper is not super high quality, so it's not going to take it, uh, take the abuse quite as well, but it's plenty good. So it doesn't have to be super expensive. It can just be on uh, bond. You can test it. Newsprint, if you scrub, it's going to tear, but you can do it uh, with vine charcoal on bond. You can do it on uh, uh, marker paper. It's really lovely. Let's see here. Now, one of the tricks with the eye, we talked about the eye, of course, the stepping back and the turning under to catch shade, the turning back up to catch light. The uh, eyelid is stepped back from the eyebrow and, of course, is laying over the eyeball and may drop straight down or might curve back, but it's catching these stair steps facing forward, half tone, facing down to shadow, and probably the, the model dark lids, uh, lashes. Facing forward, mid range. Facing up, catching maybe a highlight. Facing forward, and maybe a little back. Forward, and maybe then bumping forward for the cheekbone, and a little mid tone, lighter, mid tone, and so on. So we catch that stepping back and turning under so that the values map the values map you can see where it steps back from the eyebrow to the eyelid it dives way back in here and catches shadow most quickly oftentimes we'll have a little shadow or a darker half tone in that area on the inside the inside start of the eyebrows. That's the hollowing out, and oftentimes we'll have a, shade, a shadow here where it's dropping into shadow. And that little crease of the upper lid will turn into shadow or darker half tone or whatever. Uh, so, Now, one of the things I want to do is when I'm drawing the crease of the upper lid, and the upper edge of the upper lid, each one is kind of an all that almond arc and the eyebrows, but we want each one to have its own character. It's going to have this arcing nature to it, but
but each one will do its own thing in its own way, probably. And that's going to make it seem more nuanced. And it's their, if they're characters in a story, if we use that metaphor that I use quite a bit, then each character, even though they're there and have a lot of commonality because they're all hanging out in the same place with the same friends, probably telling the same jokes, um, they have a lot of commonality, but they also have each have their own quirks. One's more charming, one's more awkward, one's more athletic, one's more studious, whatever it is. And so we want to do the same thing here. So this arcs also for the eyebrow, but it's a, a wave. This is arcing, but in a rounder way and not perfectly parallel at the end kind of turns down a little bit. And then of course the lower lid sags and we'll, we'll rush along here so we got time. And so what I'm going to do then is I'm going to go for the mid-range values. And since I already have a mid-range value for the paper or the tone canvas, I'll leave that. I'll go to the shadows. Shadows are going to give me the biggest bang for the buck. Make sure that's on. Yep. Biggest bang for the buck in terms of popping. We draw a line. It gets the idea. But when we add tone and specifically the shadow, now we're getting that dramatic jump off the page and potentially dramatic turn of the form. And with this particular medium, or if I'm painting all a prima, I might well make that mark quite dark, knowing that as I blend it into the other paint or blend it into the paper, it'll lighten up. So I might, knowing my medium, I actually start pretty contrasting, start about here, but it's going to render to that, and then I'll bump it again. And this could be not tone, but hatched line. I'm really doing kind of soft hatched lines here. So I have control over a pretty crude instrument. I don't know what idiot gave me this. Oh, I did. I forgot. But I actually like using things a little crude. I have to be more careful. And sometimes I have things I have to fix. And sometimes they're happy accidents that don't need to be fixed at all. And it makes me see what I hadn't really noticed before in a wonderful way. Or I can switch to a very fine tool, a fine pencil, or a fine roll of paper, a stump. And now when I um, lay those in, I'm going to go, even though I'm working with a bit of a ghosted version, a mid-range version of it, I'm going to go for the darker areas, even though I'm not making them fully dark enough yet. I'm in no hurry. I'm going to take my time. And we don't have tons of time, so I'll, I'll rush it along a little bit. But no hurry. And what I'm looking for is all of the dark shadows or the dark local colors, the dark lashes, the dark iris, the dark pupil. I'm ex ignoring the darker accents as dark as they really need to be. And I'm ignoring the, the uh, highlights. Those are going to go very last. <laughs> so I'm really working in kind of half tone <clears throat> and uh, shadow and not with highlight or lighter half tone. And as I add a little bit more tone, I add a little bit of correction if I need to, and I usually need to, to these uh, structure or the contour or whatever other adjustment I feel like I need. So notice because I'm going for the 
the kind of graphic value, what's dark, whether it's shadow or local color, and what's light, and what's the simple structure it's on. It's a ball with kind of odd organic curves to the almond shape. It gives me kind of a context. Is it almond-like enough? Is it ball-like enough underneath it? And so on. One of the things I loved about Thayer is he used a lot of line. It actually left a lot of line in it, although we're on a close-up, so we're not seeing that so much here. I'm just laying those things in. And then once I'm feeling pretty good about it, then I can start going darker and darker and darker in little bit by little bit, or you can see the bigger iris for the littler girl. She's a young, young lady, so she's got a little bit of baby face still. And the shadow over it. And so you just keep building, building, building. And then once you get it to a place that you're comfortable with, and notice I'm going top to bottom because of the lid structure. Now I'm going to go side to side. I'm going to blend out of the darker part of the ball into the lighter bulge of the ball. I'll do the same thing here and on the lid here. And then this is the bottom side of the ball. That lower lid is on the bottom side of the ball. So it's getting darker down there. So I'm going top to bottom, side to side. and that takes care of the ball. Sometimes we need to do a little blending at the corner, but I break it into two steps. I gradate it this way and render it, gradate it that way and render it, or vice versa, it doesn't matter too much on the timing, on that what's first, what's second. So we'll do that, and then let's uh, then push that down darker. And you can get really painterly and attack it, or you can be um, kind of ease towards that final value range that you're See how that works? And so it starts to, uh, see what it looks like on camera. It starts to look pretty good eventually. We keep working, keep working. There's that lacrimal lake in there, little muscle uh, area, and the um, duct, really, for the tears to pull and get out of the eyesight so we can see the cave bear chasing us down. That's why we're crying, maybe. And then you can go for your accents. Uh, and you can go, you can bounce back and forth between the lighter half tones and the sh darker shadows, or you can get all of the dark stuff taken care of, all the big accents taken care of, the big darker silhouettes, the punch 
because those darks are going to give you more bang for your buck in terms of form. You can group line or you can blend tone. So here I'm noticing that even the line of that, the uh, tonal outline of that crease of the upper lid is darker here. And then once it gets here, it goes out, the line itself, the little sliver of value of that bump of the fold of the lid, like a louvered shade, gets lighter here. So I'll push it here with line, with tone, with whatever strikes my fancy or does the job or experience tells me or what I can steal from these amazing artists. So you build up, build up, build up, get, get the effect you want. And then you come in, if you haven't already, and you get the lighter lights. And oftentimes I'll put it in and then dust it back down. Pop it in, dust it back down so it's not too, too, um, attracts too much attention. And so now I'm easing, I've been, I was easing down into darker, darker, darker sh shading <clears throat> and local color because of the lashes there on the brow and the pupil and iris. And now I'm easing up into lighter and lighter solutions for that, the well-lit parts. Put one there. You can see how then a lighter halftone or highlight will pop. And I'll use a little trick sometimes you can get a real dialed in hard little corner of a eraser. You can use a little erasing uh, electric eraser and you can pick that out. And then you can just do, go, you know, as we do in our renderings, we'll go back and forth and back and forth and Maybe I want more line. Maybe I want to push down values. Maybe I want to um, bring in tone. <clears throat> and you can force that and change your mind, of course, as often as you want. Okay, so I hope that helps.